This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. I am this program's co host, DeSoto Brown. And today we've got two guests in the studio with me. We have John Hara and we have Mayumi Hara Dao. And they are both of Hara, what is the name of your architectural firm? It's John Hara Associates. John Hara Associates. And we are being joined today through the modern miracle of technology by our program's host, Martin Despang from Germany. And there he is. He's magically appeared in the West Oahu College campus. Hello there, Martin. Welcome from cold Germany where it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Thank you guys for warming up my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have you, Mayumi, and John back on the show. It's uh, terrific. And why don't we get to the first yeah. uh, slide here? Because this is uh, how uh, DeSoto and I we went through the most recent architecture on the uh, QH Manoa campus. And there are just four screenshots here. And I think in all of them, you, DeSoto, look pretty uh, desperate, I could <laughs> say. That, you know, your facial expression tells me that mm -hmm. you didn't like any of the recent stuff on the UHM Manoa campus here. Is that right? Well, I, I won't be so, I won't be 100% right. negative, but there were things right. that were better, some were better than others. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still say, you know, it's not worth even having a critical discourse on architecture, but uh, let's go to the next page. We found pieces, good exceptions to the rule from the 70s to the 80s, and which would have been the 90s, my workplace, the School of Architecture, and all of them by John. And so um, at the end of the last show, um, which we see at the very bottom right, we're introduced to do another show, and this is this show, because if an architect has been proven himself so well, he might be chosen to be hired again by the same client, and so it happens. So if we go to the third slide here, we see, and we want to also uh, reference uh, our friend, uh, activist journalist, uh, Kurt Sandburn, who has written a pretty nice piece about uh, your guys' work. And he also uh, touched on, on the um, uh, UH West Oahu campus that we're going to talk about today. And as you, John, are, are a true modernist and not a postmodernist, you don't have a single inspiration uh, for your project, but one of the ones that the journalist Kurt pointed out was the previous architecture in this era, which uh, was not urbanized yet. It was basically farmland, but it was cash crops and it was sugar cane. So here is one of the images that you provided from many other historic pictures where you can see these huge, very utilitarian shelters that became uh, an inspiration. But um, Good architect you are, you didn't get inspired by, a, by an image again, but by uh, searching and, and, and field walking the site. If we go to the next page, and please tell us a little bit what you found on the site when we look at that picture. Well, basically what this is, is it's part of what is known as um, Kaloi Gulch. There's a very important part of the site uh, as a defined uh, uh, the, um, it, divide, it defined the dividing line between the university campus and what was at that time a planned subdivision. Uh, and our intent was always to preserve it as a very important fragment of what was there before. Mm -hmm. And would it also be fair to say, too, that you wanted to keep an existing drainage system going so that you yeah, could that's what deal it with was, that, too? But the, the, it, it no longer is a drainage system, but okay. we still wanted to keep it. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next page here, we see a, a sketch that you wanted to be included and also referring to a dear colleague of yours who was involved, yeah. as I understand, as a project architect in the very early phase. And very fascinating sketch, which is about sort of almost calligraphy and regulating lines and trying to find the, the nature of, of the speci specificity of the site, right? I was a student of Romaldo Jurglas 60 years ago. And he, we still continue, or he, 
he, he still continued to be my mentor for all these years until he passed fairly recently, I think two or three years ago. But mm -hmm. every time he came here, we talked about architecture and I showed him what I was doing and he'd offer his own kind of criticism. Now, what we developed together on this particular image is the fact that, that uh, we wanted to define certain planes of the entire site. And I, I think from top to bottom, it's about a 15 foot difference. So what we did is establish platforms. And to define these platforms, we use uh, these very long, large rock walls. And I think that's in one of the next images. Yeah, yeah? correct. Right, no? right. So we probably can go to our next picture. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, mm -hmm. these are one of the walls. And the walls vary in height, they vary in width, they vary in size, all specifically to what they do and where they are. And John, we were talking before the show, and, and uh, I asked if these were also potential platforms or sites for buildings of the future, and so that there had been some level of grading and straightening of that, so this sure. is where you can build. Right, and this is part of the original master plan. Right. Uh, which was, well, like many other things, uh, totally ignored in the, in the future, uh, or as it is right now. Yeah, well. And let's move on to the next slide here, which we see another one. And Fascinating thing, it's sort of like, um, this is architecture with the absence of build, environment buildings, right? This is pretty much land art. And we, we did a show that sort of about uh, volcanic volumes and looked at, we drove out further west and went to Makaha and found some of these sort of uh, remainders of, uh, of the resort. So it's a very sort of a classy theme on the island that you sort of interpreted and modernized here. And if you go to the next, well, we have one more picture of them where you can see where they slowly and surely become more architectural and here serve as framing a staircase that is sort of, um, you know, making you go from one level to the other one. Well, Let's go to the next page. Relative, you know, relative to the material of the rock walls, we spent a lot of time working with the mason. And we went to many, mm -hmm. many sites to pick the rocks specifically yeah. Yeah. for these walls. Now, what mm -hmm. this site shows is an extension of what the rock walls do as part of a master plan for the entire campus. Right. And, um, of course, very little of it, very, well, none of it uh, has been adapted except for phase one. Correct. You, you could see the, 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 the Colloid Gulch on the right side, okay. which is All a right. very important part of Right, which we saw in the first, the first yeah. photograph right. of it. Right, right. Uh, Martin, did you want to tell us more about, uh, or we were just discussing that this, this is the master plan, and as John has said, it is not being used, unfortunately. Uh, but some of the buildings, as you said, for phase one are in, are in place now. Yeah, I know. And again, it shows even on the little uh, picture on the top right, it shows even the, the larger, the even larger scale in zoning. And really thinking about, you know, building pretty much from scratch here out in the desert. We right. should mention this is very hot arid part of the island here and really cr creating a, a community for learning from, from scratch in, in a very sort of sensitive and, and sensible way. And then if we go to the next slide here, we see that sort of first and uh, up to now only phase or initial phase, we should say, here sort of collaged into the uh, aerial sort of Google view. And if we go to the next slide here, we zoom in and we can see, um, you know, the buildings it's comprised of. And maybe you guys can tell us a little bit more about that very specific composition that is very intriguing. Well, the, the intent of the Kaloi Gauss here is very clear, I think. It, it provides a connection between the subdivision and the lower, uh, from the lower edge of the picture up to the top. Um, and the so-called entry plaza at the very beginning was a connection to the proposed at that time subdivision, which should create an entry to the university. Uh, the other buildings were scheduled to be to the left and to the right and to the bottom. Um, again, the idea here was to, 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 to maintain a great lawn for specific functions of the university, and yet all of the other open spaces were to be defined by open space, yet peely grass, which is native to the area, which is a very important 
part of the vegetation. Right, and Pili grass, which is extremely also important in Hawaiian culture, is what was used to thatch grass houses. Mm -hmm. Hale Pili, that's why they're called Hale Pili, they're houses mm -hmm. made with Pili grass. Mm -hmm. So there's a cultural significance in addition to the natural use of a plant that's native. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I was also going to say too, uh, pardon me for Martin, this is, uh, as Martin said, this is not within an existing campus, so you're starting from scratch, well, unlike at UH Manoa. Uh, absolutely. But uh, it's also an area under development in, um, in general, as you have just been pointing out, and the aspect of the train is really important here because the train is a short distance away. It's really just kind of across the highway. Yeah, initially the plan for the train was to come along Kaloi Gulch. Oh, interesting. And that was a total disaster and we fought like hell okay. against it. Right. And they, mm -hmm. they moved it. Right. <laughs> But we still expect that people will be coming and going from the site via sure, the train. Sure, sure. Right. And, and the, if you extend the, the road up uh, from the entry plaza, that's where the station is now. Yeah, okay. This is, so mm -hmm. the entry was well, truly an entry plaza. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and while this now looks like a very traditional sort of a master planning approach of composing, you know, program, um, let's move to the next page here, which actually shows that your design approach was sort of um, in, in reciprocity of, of from the outside to the inside, but also from the inside to the outside. You made these uh, great sort of study models that were simulating, you know, frame views and how the light comes in and how it plays, you know, becomes an, an element in the, in, in the project. Maybe you can mm -hmm. describe it a little further. Guys, yeah, don't mind. Yeah, the, the light, or where the, the direction of where the light came from in this particular project was very important. For example, the library, the main, main windows of the library face direct north, so you don't get direct sunlight. And most of the buildings are uh, similarly sighted, and when, when they do face other, we made certain consideration for that. Um, all of the buildings, uh, we've introduced daylight into the center core of the building. And mm -hmm. th this model shows one of the early studies for how the light comes mm -hmm. in. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and as an archivist, studies, if we go to the mm -hmm. I just want to say as an archivist and somebody who takes care of museums collections, I am very grateful that you took natural light into account in protecting the interiors from direct sunlight. Oh, absolutely, and it's very important. Uh, it's extremely uh, important, but not uh, everybody knows that. Well, <laughs> thank they goodness you do. That. They <laughs> should, they should, but thank goodness you do. Yes, yes. so I guess our very next slide. Good. We go to the next slide, and here we, we see how these sort of studies then basically um, led to the sort of amassing of the, the actual buildings here. And, and again, we refer to our, my visit in your office at the very bottom right, which we featured in the, in the last show about Manoa. You guys are very sort of high on, on physical model making um, in, in various scales. And the next scale we see in the next slide here, which is a large architectural study model. Again, that is not a representational model. That's not your final model to show up. This is really a design process model, right? Yeah, and it's important to, to, to do these models out of cardboard because you can feel, you can touch, and you can study them. It's difficult to do this uh, computer images these days, and unfortunately, I think that's, that's what the profession is towards now. It, you know, computer it images. is, and... and but that was a great segue into the next slide because you guys are multimedia savvy and this is, uh, this is a computer rendering which I like to call them suggestive illustrations. And this is a very delicate one and it pretty much shows you a very ambitious uh, goal of um, basically providing wealth of space I would call it and, and generosity of volume. I'm, I'm impressed as a practicing architect how you were able to convince a, a public client of such richness and, and generosity. So kudos to that. <laughs> and, and if we move on to the next page, um, this is a, uh, you, you told me that David Franson has been working with you through all your career and photographed all your projects. And this is a David Franson 
final documentation. And I have to say that it's almost hard to make a difference between the, the rendering and, <laughs> the, and the final yeah. product. Yeah. So my biggest compliment, again, to having been resisting, uh, resistant to that value engineering thing that you know public clients like to do these days, and you pretty much fought through all your very ambitious um, strategies here. Very impressive. Yeah, and before the show we were talking uh, and uh, the rendering or the, the, as you said, the suggestive illustration and the real picture, as you said, are so close together you wouldn't necessarily know the difference except that the previous one is from a, a vantage point that you couldn't actually be in in person. That's the mm -hmm. only way you can mm -hmm. tell it's not a real picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what this particular image shows, I think, is the value of natural light from yeah. both the left and the right. And it also shows the value of artificial lighting, which is just mm -hmm. as important mm -hmm. because you don't get daylight at night, obviously. That's and right. Artificial light is very important. And you don't get daylight into every part of a building either. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of these things. That, uh, um, and successful, too. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide here, where we see how that then uh, looks from the outside. And, and this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the classroom uh, building part, and it's the uh, southern elevation. So I want to point out sort of like the biochromatic aspect of design that the big glazing on the on the top floor basically has a huge even overhang that shades it sufficiently and also sheds the water off it. Um, and then the bottom part is relatively opaque, has few openings, and the glass is being pushed back in. So that way, it's a very climate conducive design that that works well in again that very sort of harsh sort of hot arid climate of that specific area of the island. And to go further with that, uh, we selected unfinished concrete block as, as the material of choice. And the reason for that is that it's a very ordinary material, it was, uh, entirely compatible with the plantation mm -hmm. architecture. Mm -hmm. However, what we did was craft it to 12 inch by 12 inch squares, 16 inches deep weighing mm -hmm. approximately, I guess, 60 pounds and driving the Masons crazy. What the idea here was to sort of replicate the character of the old plantation, or the old plantations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a contemporary Very material. successful, yeah. Right, right, right. And if we move on to the next slide, we see a close-up. There's a yeah, picture right. I, I took when I was out there, and I was intrigued exactly what you said, and I would call it like a post-contact uh, you know, indigenous material because we have, you know, Campbell Industrial Park and we have many TMU and concrete manufacturers out there. So this is where, you know, and, and three of the four ingredients of concrete are potentially from the island, which is water aggregates and, and basically um, sand. And the cement is the only imported material. So it's a very sort of a, a clever choice that is, that is not nostalgic about, um, about, things right. This is not a hula approach, right? No. I'm not yeah. trying to well, pretend uh, to be something that, you know, you, you found inappropriate. You know, as part of the process, uh, Mason involved, uh, we did many studies of this and uh, they suggested things like adding aggregate uh, and making it look better than ordinary concrete block. And we always mm -hmm. went back to the concept of make it regular concrete block. And it's interesting yeah. to see that other buildings on the UH campus, as a matter of fact, are doing took that. the samples uh, <laughs> that we rejected. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I these won't were, be specific yeah. about that. I won't be specific. And these, and these you had manufactured to your specs for that particular size, which is not a standard size. Right, yet. and it's not a standard size. And uh, yeah. it was driving everybody nuts. But, but um, It's a done deal now, whether they were nuts <laughs> yeah, or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yes, I wanted to, uh, can I just add, we yeah. also um, decided to show that the buildings were very crafted. So we lined up all of the joints oh, yeah. on the flooring and we spent a lot of time, you know, trying to line everything up so it would look very um, put together yeah. and on purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, next time mm -hmm. I go, I'm going to look at that specifically. Yes. Okay, next picture. Very, 
the next picture, and, and this is, I like that when I was in there, this is a, a lanai, so another very sort of local theme that you introduce, and this is the uh, laboratory building part, and this is facing the classroom building that we just looked at. And so I, I like that, um, you know, the the soil is pretty much red there. It's like red desert, and and through the choice of plants and also just leaving the dirt, it just crawls up. The dirt crawls up the building and gives it a texture. So it's oh. you know it's, it's it's invited to pick up patina. So it's it's not a clean, sterile, but a very sort of organic approach. Well, I think what this image shows is also the spacing between buildings, and the spaces between buildings were as carefully designed yeah. as the spaces within the yeah. buildings. Yeah, and that was very important as to specifically where the openings were, where the connections between the buildings were, and especially you can see that the location of the rock walls. And that is something very much lacking in the UH Manoa campus, which has grown in a very piecemeal manner with yes. many different yes. architects and many different yes. layouts over yes. the years. Yeah. And we also want to add maybe the, you know, the theme of your projects in Manoa, especially uh, DeSoto's favorite Sherman Lab project yeah. is is working with DeSoto's favorite theme of courtyards, yeah. mm -hmm. which we can see reinterpreted here as well as the big outdoor spaces are like functionally like big big courtyards. And as you said, the big lawn. I, I think I remember you guys. You said whenever there are like big ceremonies, no, graduation like yeah. or big gatherings, no. this becomes an outdoor yes. classroom yes. or, or yeah. gathering mm -hmm. space. Yes, right? yes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's Bishop Museum functions the same way. We have a big lawn sure. and it's used for concerts, it's sure. used for all different things. Sure. Same situation right, there. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next slide. That is an, a photo, an aerial, a photo, a airplane photograph of when the project was just finished, I believe, here. And you can still see how red dirtish the surrounding oh, is yeah. and the landscaping <laughs> is starting. And uh, we also, there's a little. Uh, Sort of a teardrop here that one of the uh, phase one uh, buildings is uh, is missing and, and I know this is sort of as much of a little bit of a wound as the architecture <laughs> school building is at you age so <laughs> maybe sort of a, a sort of a tragic tradition but um, Let's move to the next slide here that I took uh, when I was out there and um, basically this this building was just almost finished and I stood in it and I basically, we don't want to talk about it here today because we want to celebrate and honor your great work, but I think uh, if you don't mind DeSoto, if we guys maybe go ahead and with the inspiration of today's show, just, you know, continue to be uh, architectural critics and, and yeah. look at what uh, the, the client had decided to do, which I uh, imported that little um, excerpt from a Kurt's article where he was basically, when he was interviewing, um, he, he heard that you guys had designed that building and you got paid for your work. And then the, uh, the, the client decided to uh, Hold the project and commission another architect and design it from all over and, and pay this guy again or pay this firm again, which then we might ask ourselves how you know responsible is that with taxpayers' money? Well, we not only had the building design, we had a contractor on board, we, we, we knew what the construction costs were and we had a building permit. And for mm -hmm. whatever reason, uh, they didn't think that we could resolve the functional problems of whatever they put in the new building. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let's Beyond not, my capacity. I, let's look at what we see here in the distance, which is the most iconic part. And if you go to the next picture here, the most iconic part of what you have so masterfully completed here. And this is the icon a tower and, and beacon of the library building. Well, what this does is it does, well, it does many things, but, but uh, we go back to the old idea of the plantations, mm -hmm. and the plantations yeah. had chimneys for, for, for yeah. a very good reason. Well, it didn't make sense to put a chimney in a library building, but, uh, you know, as part of our philosophy of incorporating art with architecture, 
we decided to do this tower, which is a work of art. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the artist spent days at the site thinking about what this thing should look like. Uh, her name was Carol Bennett from the island of mm. Kauai. Mm -hmm. And she, she still talks about the experience of doing this thing. Um, originally, members of the art committee wanted something like a, a, um, you know, a tapa pattern or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, like. yeah, yeah. But, but we said that we didn't think that was such a good idea. Right. And we made this as part of the art master plan, which we did and completed, but, but unfortunately, it's not going very far. No. But, but mm -hmm. this was a major part of the project, I think. And right. I think it's fascinating right. you were inspired by the smokestack of sure. the mill. Right, right. right because right. you're absolutely right. That was how you saw the, the sure. sugar mill, and you knew the That's plantation around, town was around it. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Very and the good. great uh, ph photographer that David Franson is, he knows how to celebrate that even more. So if we go to the next slide here, we see how that thing comes alive when it gets dark outside. So it's like hopping out and it's like a lighthouse. Yeah, well, well, like what we were afraid of with, with the FAA, they're going to mm. complain about the airplanes flying <laughs> by. <laughs> it wasn't tall enough, <laughs> fortunately, that, yeah. That never happened. <laughs> Thank God, yeah. yeah. I think uh, we're getting close to the end of yes, the show. Yes, we are. You, DeSoto, don't mind taking over and walking us through our tradition of uh, con uh, concluding with some polemic propositions here. Sure. Move to the next slide. Right. Talking Beacon. Yeah. So this is Martin's classes have uh, at UH Monoa, architectural classes, have worked on a number of projects. And this is one of them. This is Primitiva. Primitiva is a tower. It is a housing tower. And we're considering what it would look like if it was placed in a similar location to where we've just been talking about, the West Oahu College campus. So at night, because Primitiva is primarily an open building, uh, you'd see it more perhaps than you would during the day. So here we see in the nighttime with the starry sky and the guy with the bicycle with the light on it, there is the glowing tower. If we go to the next picture, we see that as the light is coming up, we are transitioning from the lit cylindrical building to the way it would look in daylight. And in our next picture, we see that in a, in a, in a wonderful world of, uh, of our hopes, because the, pro because the tower is primarily open and because it has a lot of vegetation growing in it, in theory, it might even blend into the background so that people are living in it, but you don't necessarily even see it. And it isn't that prominent in the landscape. And so that's the hope in any case. And um, that's, again, this is not something that's actually built, but the West Oahu College campus is actually built and being built. And as time passes, we are going to see urbanization come to that area very strongly. And we're going to be looking back. And I'm grateful that you looked back and said you were acknowledging what was there before as this turns into a city, which it will. No, yeah. there's, there's, there's really nothing wrong with urbanization. It's just a matter of how do you do it. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. Well, Martin, do you well, have anything you guys, else to add? Well, you guys see that, please, as a great homage to your, to your absolutely fantastic work out there. Thank you very much. And I want to conclude with the last slide here. Ah, yes. Which is in the tradition of that. Yes. We, have used, uh, we have used automobiles uh, for a while <laughs> as vehicles for thought. Please. And Literally, while getting yes. to know each other uh, closer, we started to talk about um, how we get around <laughs> when you know we're Sunday drivers and you're the owner of this fantastic pagoda <laughs> that we then found out we happen to have the same uh, genius mechanic who allows us to keep these fantastic cars. And at the very top left is Larry. So we want to say hi to Larry. Thanks for taking <laughs> care of us. And, and, and for me, you know, your car is sort of symbolic or representative of, of who you are and what your work is, John and, and Mayumi. Very classy, very timeless, very elegant, very low key, uh, you know, opposite to what architecture wants to be today, loud and, and bling, uh, very, very subtle and, and very um, appropriate. So, um, yeah, with that, um, I... Want to, want to thank you again, and, and talking uh, sort of mid-60s um, young-timers or old-timers, 
Uh, I want to say tomorrow there's a mid-60s young timer, old timer, and that's the Soto. And since I won't see you before tomorrow, when it's your 65th birthday, I already want, I already want to wish you all the best for that one. Oh, my God, I'm getting old. You see how gray and white my beard is. That's because I'm an old man. <laughs> Well, thank you, Martin, for bringing that up. Uh, that's perfectly <laughs> necessary. But thank you, guests, for being thank here. Very, for very us. wonderful uh, program. Thank, thank you, Martin, you. for helping thank doing you. Uh, getting this all together. And uh, next time, I'll be on with somebody from Docomomo talking about something architectural. Uh, that's next week. But in the meantime, week after that, Martin and I will be back with another Human Humane Architecture program. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. See you again next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>